Okay, um, I'm just gonna share the, the PowerPoint, just a moment. Sorry, technical difficulties. <laughs> Here we go. Okay, well, um, you've uh, joined me for African American Genealogy Research Basics. My name is Elaine Hayes. I work for the Laramie County Library System as uh, the Assistant Manager of Adult Services and Reference Librarian. Um, I have been teaching genealogy and doing my own genealogy for about 16 years now. And I've been teaching this class through its very variations since, since the beginning. Um, and we'll go ahead and get started. As I mentioned, uh, it's about an hour and 15 minutes long, so we better get started. Um, if I have anyone coming in, I will let them in as they get here. Sometimes I hear from people who think that uh, African-American genealogy is not possible. They, they think there are not any records available, you know, before, prior, prior to 1870. Um, but I recently found this quote from Shannon Christmas, who is an African-American genealogist himself and, and is an expert in African-American genealogy. And he says, despite claims to the contrary, tracing African-American ancestors and their lives prior to 1870 is not only possible, but a frequent occurrence among practitioners of African-American genealogy. Pre-1870 records of African-American forebears do in fact exist, even if too few Americans, genealogists among them, know how to access or use them. So I thought that was pretty encouraging. And it was also recent, it's just from July, 2020. And he writes a genealogy blog and that's where I found this quote. And uh, forgive me that occasionally I may do something like I just did, which is just read right off the screen. But um, sometimes I know that you guys are looking at little tiny screens. So I'm, I'm trying to help you out to, uh, um, give you that information. Uh, you may have seen some great genealogy TV programs such as Finding Your Roots. And uh, this is a recent one. Uh, uh, Henry Louis Gates is the historian that's in charge of this series. Um, it's, it's good to kind of inspire you to what's possible with genealogy. Um, it doesn't show all the work that goes into it behind the scenes, um, but but it, it does show you exactly kind of what they've done, the research they've done, the paperwork they've, they've found and things like that. Um, and he has a lot of African-American guests. Uh, these are the research steps and these are from Black Roots by um, Tony Burroughs, which is a book that we have in our library here. Begin with yourself and work backwards in time, which is something that you should always do, no matter what kind of genealogy you're doing. Start with yourself, find out about uh, birth dates, death dates, marriage dates, places people lived of your um, parents, and then your grandparents, then your great grandparents, and find out what you maybe already know about your family. Uh, and you work on researching your family back to 1870, via the census records, vital records, et cetera. If you have enslaved um, ancestors, you try to find the last slave owner and you need to research that slave owner's family and, and the history of slavery. Uh, hopefully you can trace your family back to Africa uh, and you may need to research Canada and the Caribbean because there, it comes up a lot. Um, read a few good books. We have, these are books that are actually in the Laramie County Library collection that you can check out. Um, they're in the 929s uh, in the Dewey Decimal Call number. Um, Genealogist's Guide to Discovering Your African-American Ancestors, Black Roots by Tony Burroughs, which I've mentioned already. Um, Finding a Place Called Home, A Guide to African-American Genealogy by Dee Woodtor is not only, um, help you with your genealogy, 
but it's a, how she actually found it. And, and this was even before the internet, most of her research. So, um, but it's, it still stands. These same techniques will still work. Okay, and I already mentioned, you, you start with what you already know about your family, begin your research at home, um, uh, talk to your relatives. And even if your parents or grandparents are not still alive, um, you can maybe find aunts and uncles, your cousins, um, siblings that are maybe older, anybody, old family friends, and see if they can share information, documents, photos, family memorabilia, vital records like birth and death certificates, things like that. Uh, just let them know you're interested. You might find that there are other people in the family that are also interested in genealogy and have done some of the work for you and they might share their, their information. Um, look for family papers. These are the type of things that people tend to um, save in, in their family. Photographs, scrapbooks, um, those, all those vital records, birth, marriage and death certificates, newspaper clippings, funeral cards, military records, things like that. And when you're talking to your family, not only get all the facts, the dates and times, but get the stories. Uh, find out about, you know, their re religious, educational, political climate, anything that was going on at the time. And it just makes your, your family history a lot more interesting, but they also may be giving you clues. Okay. Elaine, excuse me, should we be seeing slides? Because we don't... Are you not Slides. I'm no, no slides. Just you. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank That's you for okay. telling. Okay, I'm gonna mute myself now. Okay, I I tried to send you a message. Okay, I'm gonna mute myself. Well, you no, know, I'm not seeing the chat. So, I'm sorry. I'm seeing the slides. I thought you were too. Um, let me try again. Um. Do you see that? You see that? Okay. All right. Um, okay. I just somebody tell me that that you do you see the slide now? Do you saw, yes. see a slide? Yeah, we can see them. Okay. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay. Um, one way to sort of organize your genealogy is to start with these ancestry charts. Oh, I've got somebody to admit. All right. Um, and I have some of the ancestry charts that we can just give away here at, at the library, or you can just uh, print them, you know, from, from the internet or wherever. Um, if you're using these, generally you start with yourself as number one, and then um, your father is number two, your mother's number three. Um, males on this are even numbers. Um, their spouses are, are odd numbers, one greater than the husband. So uh, when you're filling out something like an ancestry chart, use full names, including the woman's maiden name, uh, dates and places of birth or her birth name, marriages and deaths. Um, write those dates in military or European style, for instance, 08 October 1888, to avoid confusion of, you know, what, what's the month, what's the day. Um, surnames, put surnames in capital letters so you know what, which one is the surname. These are just sort of genealogy standards. And this is more of an up-close look at an ancestor chart and the ones we have at the library are similar to this. Um, and you'll notice that they keep going on and on. <laughs> uh, this is, a, I think, a five generation chart, but uh, if you needed more than five generations, you're gonna go back farther than that. Number 16 there at the top uh, would be number one on a new chart. And that's you know where it says chart number, whatever, you can label those. 
you need to, you'll start accumulating a lot of papers if you're doing genealogy you can have a notebook or file or or you can use a computer program to tell you the truth i don't write very much down you know on paper anymore i enter my family tree information directly into some kind of a computer program you can get a software that that just lives on your computer that's private um, and things like legacy family tree gramps project actually have some down uh, programs that you can download for free. If you want a fancier program, then you're usually paying 25, 30, 35 or more dollars. Uh, you can also start uh, your family tree at places like ancestry.com, familysearch.org or other places. I know there's a wiki tree. Um, seems like uh, there was another, but there are several places that you can start free family trees. Um, some of those are more or less public. So just so you know that, um, that, that other people could maybe see them unless you um, set your privacy settings so they can't. Um, we'll come back to Ancestry and Family Search later. You're gonna do a lot of search on online genealogy data Basis. We're going to talk mostly about Ancestry Library Edition, and Ancestry Library Edition can be accessed through uh, your, your library, such as Laramie County Library, uh, for free until March 31st, 2021. Usually, they want you to go into the library rather than access it um, with your library card from home but they realize that a lot of libraries are closed, so they're, they're allowing home access. Uh, when you start searching, you can just um, hit up the green button that says search, or you can go under that search, um, search all categories, or just census or whatever from here. Um, I did a card catalog search just to show you what kind of databases might be specific to African American, and I uh, put in as keyword African American. Um, I circled some of the bigger ones here. Um, U.S. Freedmen's Bureau records. There's 27,000 names plus names. Um, African American Civil War sailors. Uh, it looks like 68,000 plus. African American newspaper information that is 210,000 names. Uh, and I already said uh, Ancestry Library Edition is available for searching at home until March 31st. And it actually says that you can go directly to gowild.net and you will have to put in your library card number and PIN if you uh, uh, have a Laramie County Library card. It, um, it's a long number. Uh, don't put the A at the front, the B at the end. Um, and um, the, the pin is usually either wild, W-Y-L-D, or read, unless you've changed it to something else. And there's also another African American Heritage Database. This is what the African American Heritage Database looks like. Um, uh, it has... Um, Afrogenius, as which we'll we'll talk about again later, as one place to look. FamilySearch.org is the LDS or the Mormon Church's family history uh, website, and they have the largest um, family history library in Salt Lake City in the world, and they have digitized almost all of their collection and indexed it. And you can uh, have an account for free. You will have to sign in or, and create a free account, but it doesn't cost you anything. You know, Everything that they've got is available for you for free. Um, and occasionally they will have some restrictions on some of the things that you can see. But if you come into the library, you'll be able to see it because we are a, a family history library affiliate. So if you run into that, oh, it says I can't see this because of copyright or something, then come into the library. But this is a great database that you can search always at home for free. Uh, the US National Archives is another great place to find records. 
um, anything that was originally federal, like military records, immigration, naturalization, um, the Freedmen's Bank, military records, I think I already mentioned that census, um, are, the original repository is the National Archives. Okay, our first set steps are usually to search the census. My phone's ringing. Okay. <laughs> um, the, the US federal census has been done every, every 10 years from 1790 to 2020. Um, the 1790 to the 1940 censuses are available for genealogists to search on, on genealogy databases such as Ancestry Library Edition and Family Search. Uh, this is sort of an example of just one um, scanned census. Um, the, the census taker would just go down the street with their great big ledger form, and they would talk to the head of the household, uh, get their name, get the names of other people in the household. And, and if they were recording every na name of everyone in the household, they would start with the head of the household, then the, um, the, the mother, which is usually the father, and then the mother, his wife, and then all the children from the oldest to the youngest. And then if there's anybody else in, living in the household, such as servants, hired hands, etc., they would come next. Mother-in-law, they, they would come next. And we'll, we're gonna see some examples of this. Um, 1790, 1940, available for you to search. The reason why you don't have 1950 and to 2020 is because there's a 72 year privacy rule on these. So the 1950 census will be available in uh, 2022, which is coming up next year. So, and they're getting faster and faster about releasing these. So they might be already working on it and it will be released right away. We can only hope. Uh, <clears throat> for African-American genealogy, it's important to remember that in 1866, the 14th amendment was passed to make all American born blacks US citizens. So, um, Earlier censuses would only have free blacks in the census. Uh, enslaved people were not in the census before 1870. So the 1870 census is the first listing made of all African Americans by name in the federal census. But there were a significant portion of people that were free blacks and they have been in the census every, always listed every year since 1790, every 10 years. So those 1870 to 1940 censuses, the newer ones, list every person by name uh, with relationship to the head of the household, age, occupations, birthplaces, et cetera, all the questions that they asked from 1870 on for everyone. Um, you should start, so they're really valuable. There's a lot of information you can get from them. Start with the most recent census and, um, 1940 and work backwards. So I often tell people that if you know of at least one person, one ancestor that was would have been alive in that 1940 census, start with them, and which is usually a, a father, grandfather, great grandmother, whatever, you know, so whoever was alive in 1940 and work backwards. As I mentioned before, free black heads of households were listed in the census. Um, since the first census in 1790. And just prior to the Civil War, there were 400,000 free Blacks, as opposed to 4 million enslaved people. But there were, there were some, so you could, could have ancestors that were free Blacks. Um, 1790 to 1840, only free heads of households were listed by name. So just the, the father, just the, the, usually the father, the head of the household, not, so usually no women, no children are listed by name of any race. Uh, in 1850 to 1860, there was a special schedule called a slave schedule 
And this would list um, gender and age of all the enslaved people in the household. And the only name that would appear would be this, the slave owner. Um, the slave schedules can be searched on ancestry by the slave owner's name. Um, if you're going to do some searching on, on ancestry, I was just going to show you how to get there. Uh, we go to Laramie County Library. It's lclsonline.org. Um, you can click on the library catalog, which is sort of top left hand side. Uh, when you're at, at our library catalog, there are databases, which I've circled in red. Um, and you can also see that we are in searching the Cheyenne catalog. This is where you'd go if you just want to search and see what books we have. Uh, you can change that to just genealogy books if you wonder if there's a, a family history, because we have 20,000 genealogy books in our special collection. So if you want to know if there's a family history for your family name, or if there's, you know, cemetery records of a certain cemetery, you know, whatever you'd like to, to search there, that might be in our books. If you click on databases, then you then you get it gets you to go wild.net, which is what we saw a little bit earlier, which would list all our databases. Uh, the easiest way to get to the genealogy databases is down at the bottom. Uh, there's four things listed under genealogy. You can also browse by title if you wanted to go straight to ancestry. Okay, and this is what ancestry looks like. You can search on the green button, or you can click on the census, search census. There's also a search search button up top, which is the one that I usually use because I like it to open up and look like this. <laughs> um, and you can search right there. There's all other ways to search below. You can search by location. Uh, you can show more options and add other things to search. But um, it's good to, you, you need a full name of someone, at least a last name, if it's an unusual last name, and a place that they, they might live, or a, a, a guesstimate on a birth year. In this case, I am looking for Michelle Obama's family, and I know her father was named Frazier Robinson, and he was born in Illinois. I also know he was born about 1935. So I don't know too much to get started, but that's enough. So I put in Fraser Robinson, Illinois, USA. When I got the results back, I got 262,899 results, which I'm, there's no way I'm looking through that many results. But the nice thing is the, um, the best results are gonna be first in Ancestry. Um, and this case, the first three here, uh, U.S. World War II draft cards um, and the World War II Army enlistment records and the Cook County, Illinois birth index, all are for her family. Actually, the first two, Frazier Robinson, born in 1912, is not her father, but her grandfather. And the third one, Frazier Robinson, born in Cook County, Illinois, is her father. So we're going to look at each one here and look at the actual record. You can kind of see, um, you know, a relative's name, a place in South Carolina and a place in, you know, Cook County, Illinois, um, to see if, if this looks like it could be the family. And I've looked at each one of them. I almost always look at the first couple of pages because those are usually good matches. And... I'm just gonna look at each one in order. So we're gonna look at the World War II draft card for young men. Um, and you can, it, it summarizes what it says. Uh, we have name, race, age, uh, relationship to draftee, um, birth date, birthplace. So this is a Frazier Robinson born in, in Georgetown, South Carolina, uh, 24th of August, 1912. If you didn't know that birth date, that's some good information. And uh, um, 
the draft cards for World War I and World War II don't necessarily mean they served, but you'll see next that he did, but because we'll see um, enlistment records too. But he's living in Chicago in 1940. And um, you can see his employer's name is the Willow Inn. Uh, Charlene, Charlena Childs is just a friend. You'll see that on the next page. But some good information. And I've also circled the suggested records over in red at the bottom because um, these are things that Ancestry thinks are the same person. So they're usually worth looking at. And uh, because they usually are <laughs> the same person as the person in the record that you're looking at. Uh, here's the actual um, record. And we have an, his address. Um, it does say Mrs. Charlena Childs is a friend. And um, it actually at the bottom is his signature. So that's another cool thing. If that's your ancestor to find the signature of your ancestor. You can save it up at the top on the right hand side. You could save it, bring in a flash drive to the library or, or have one because you, you can save that record just to your flash drive. Um, you can uh, print it. The, the other little arrow is pointing to something that looks like two, two things crossed. And that's where you're going to find things like printing and stuff there. You can make this bigger or smaller. There's a little slider. Um, at the bottom, you notice that we're looking at basically microfish slide. Um, and you can go to the, the, the next page or the page before. Sometimes this could be continued like the back side or something on the next page. Or it could be another record for the same person. So it's always good to look page before and page after. And of course, as you find this information, record it or write it down or something if you think it's the right person. Uh, the next thing was the World War II Army enlistment records. And um, it, you'll, you'll notice I kind of circled this at the box. It's all important, but the marital status, status says separated without dependents, which is probably why he's got, he's separated. Uh, from his wife. He's got just a friend on as um, next to kin on, on the previous record. But it's the same person, 1912, um, born in South Carolina. And it's, um, but he's actually enlisting into the army at this point in uh, 26th of March, 1941. Uh, the third one, we have a Fraser Robinson born on the 1st of August, 1935. Uh, this is the previous Fraser Robinson's son. There's actually three of them. Michelle Obama had her father, her grandfather, and her great grandfather were all, all named Fraser Robinson, which made it a little confusing, but I'll try to sort it out for you. <laughs> Okay, the next three, we have um, Cook County, Illinois marriage index, Frazier Robinson III, remember her father was the third, uh, spouse Marion Shields, that's Michelle Obama's mother, uh, and they're married in Cook County, Illinois in 1960. Uh, the next thing was a Cook County, Illinois marriage index for Frazier C. Robinson and LaVon Johnson. And in 1934, and they um, remember Frazier Robinson III was born in 1935. This is his parents' marriage in 1934. Uh, the third one, U.S. find a grave for Frazier Carlton Robinson III is her dad um, and his information, his burial information. And at the way at the bottom, we have a, a 1940 census that says Francis Robinson, which when I first looked at that, I thought, well, that doesn't, that's not the same person, but it's, it's still on that first page. So I think it's worth looking at. 
Okay, here's the first marriage index. And this is just an index. We don't have an image because it's just index information, not a scanned in original record. But if I wanted to purchase it from the Cook County um, County Courthouse, I could do that. And it might be only available because of how old it is. This is 1960. So it might be because it's older than 50 years that it's available for you just to purchase if you wanted to. Um, so their marriage date, I have a marriage date. So I'm keeping track of all this records of 27th October, 1960. And I have a whole bunch of suggested records. And my guess is that there's so many of these is because this is Michelle Obama's family and other people have done just what I've done and, and found uh, family information for her. And, but these should be uh, her father, things that refer to her father's family. And we'll look at some of those too. Okay, this is the second one is the marriage in 1934. Um, so um, grandpa and grandma's marriage and, um, and Frazier and Levon Johnson. And also not an image for this one too, but we've got all the, the important information there. And you certainly could, if it was your family, order the original a copy of the original. Uh, I also circled the 1930 and 1920 United States Federal Census because I'm going to follow those clues too uh, later on and look at the census information. This is actually that 1940 census. It was so long that I kind of cut off the, the top to look at the bottom. We have uh, household members, we have the funny family, the copers, and then we have, it says Laron Johnson and Francis Robinson and Normal Robinson. And well, Lavon and Laron kind of probably look the same. So it's good to look at the original image to see. And if you look at this, it looks like, it looks like Lavon Robinson to me. And it looks like Frazier Robinson, not Francis. Um, so I think whoever indexed this just got the names wrong. <laughs> that, that this is the right family. Um, you know, in this we have, she's living as a, a, a boarder or a lodger in the, the funny household. And um, uh, we have race. It says NEG. Sometimes it would say B for black, but this is NEG for Negro. And um, Levon is 25, Frazier is four, and Normal is um, two. And um, they are the son of, both of them are sons of Levon. They, it says they were all born in Illinois, uh, which jives with what we, we know about Frazier. He was born in Cook County, Illinois. And they asked some other questions. Um, this is 1940 census, so they actually asked where you lived in 1935, and I see that there's nothing there, which leads me to believe that um, Levon did not answer the questions here. Someone else in the family, um, in the household, you know, maybe they weren't there or whatever, answered the questions, and and they knew where they were born and how old the kids were, but they didn't know where she lived in 1935. So they just didn't answer that question. And some other questions over here that were, didn't get answered either. Uh, it's good to look like the page before and the page after of the census because often uh, family members will live nearby. But um, in 1940, uh, she is um, separated from, from uh, Frazier uh, Robinson and um, that's why He's not here. He's not listed. Um, in the 1930 census, we have Frazier Robinson. And um, it says Frazier Robertson. And it may or may not be Robertson or Robertson. Uh, spelling doesn't really count 
in um, genealogy because everybody's name changed somewhere or the spelling of it changed. Um, but we can look at it and see what you think. But we have um, a whole Robertson family. We have Fraser Robert Robertson, who is the, um, uh, this is in the 1930 census. So this is grandpa and with his father um, and mother, but Fraser and Rosa Robertson. So we have the, the oldest Fraser Robinson here. And a lot of suggested records about this family that we're, we're gonna wanna look at. And you'll see that they're in South Carolina, which makes sense because that's where he said he was born. If you look at this page, let's see, I was trying to figure out whether it says Robertson or Robinson and it could be read either way. But I've found other records where it is Robertson. So they may have just changed the, the name. And notice that they are at the bottom of the page. So there's a, there's a possibility that there's more family on the next page. So we're gonna go look. Um, you'll see that everybody in the family, um, it, will, it asks for the names and ages of, of people, whether they're married or single, uh, how, how long um, the, the couple had been married. It asks everyone, um, where they were born, which is the first line that says South Carolina, and where their father, which is the next line, and their mother was born. So everybody was born in South Carolina. Everybody's mother and father were born in South Carolina, according to the census that year. Um, this is the next page. And yes, there's two more daughters. There's a son and a daughter on the next page, it's the youngest. This, a seven-year-old and a four-year-old on the next page. Um, and it's good to record if you're working on your own family, all these kids, uh, all the, not just your direct ancestor, but, but the, the uh, brothers and sisters also, because that, if you, do a DNA test, for instance, you're gonna find um, um, DNA relatives and they're probably going to be related to you through, um, not directly, but through uh, one of these siblings. So, so knowing who they are will give you some more clues finding your, your family. Okay, the 1920 census, and um, this is before, um, the youngest, Fraser Robinson, was born. So, so we're definitely looking for the the next um, couple of generations back. These are um, Fraser Robertson, the great grandfather, and Rosa, great grandmother. Fraser Robins, Rob, Robertson Senior Junior is only six years old. They are in Georgetown, um, Georgetown County. Georgetown, the city in South Carolina. And it also says they're, they live on Sawpit Road. Um, he's a laborer. So they give some information of the, what the family does. And um, if you look up, up and down, you will see that um, they do record race. That's what the W's and B's are. Um, not only the names of everyone in the household from the head of household and the wife and the children from the youngest, oldest to the youngest. Um, they record male or female, race, age, uh, married or single. They asked the question in 1920, whether you attended school, whether you can read and you can write. Um, Frazier Robertson, great grandpa, it says no, that he could not read. Uh, the other, other members of the family, if they were old enough, they had gone to school and could read and write. And the census taker here must have had a, a stamp for South Carolina because they look like they've just been stamped over and over at birthplace for everyone in South Carolina. 
Uh, this is the 1990 census. And um, this is great grandpa, Fraser Robertson. And we have a birth date now of 1884. Um, if you look at his age, it, it computes that about 1884 is when he was born. Um, and uh, he is actually listed as a servant in a white household. Uh, this is the 1900 census. He's only 16 years old. Uh, it was the, the, the Nesmith um, family and you would put servants last after everybody else in the family. So we have Fraser Robertson uh, listed after the, their youngest child there, an 11 year old child. Um, here uh, we have him born in South Carolina and his both of his parents born in South Carolina. This is the, the youngest, Fraser Robinson or Michelle Obama's um, father. And this is Fraser Carlton Robinson III uh, from the find a grave listing, but we have a lovely picture of him as a, um, a military man, an army man. Um, so we're finding out a little bit more about him. His death date, it was the 6th of March, 1991. I circled visit website because I want to do that. I want to take a look at what the find a grave listing looks like. And then I have um, some nice pictures of the family with baby Michelle Obama on, on mom's lap and some other pictures. Um, and there are links to other family members. For instance, um, his father, Fraser Robinson, born in 1912 and died in 1996. We can click on that. And there's a picture of him, a picture of the, the, the uh, headstones. Um, there's information about his family. Um, and I circled uh, the, the born August 24th, 1912 in Georgetown. South Carolina. He was the son of the late Frazier and Rosa Ella Cohen Robinson. So we, we've got a hint about what Rosa's um, maiden name was. He was a retired postal clerk and member of the Bethel AME Church. So that's another clue. You can find some really great clues from find a grave listings. Um, this is the Frazier Robinson that we had this um, the great grandpa earlier we said his birthday was 1894 um, this says a birth of 1891 uh, it's possible that they were quite sure when he was born um, since he was illiterate um, birthdays may, might not have been that important who knows um, they were probably poor but um, or he's not the person that answered the question in the census. And somebody said, oh, I think he's about 16. So that's what they put down. Maybe he was a little older. Uh, I circled the part here where it says, James Robertson, AKA Robinson, and his first wife, Susan Johnson, were the parents of Frazier Robinson, Robertson. So I could go back another um, generation to James and S Susan, Robert Robinson or Robertson in Georgetown, South Carolina. But uh, that's a little bit harder to find a James and Susan um, before. Uh, and another reason why it's hard is because the 1890 census um, burned up and uh, it's not available. So you do have to skip from 1900 to 1880 and it's, it's easy to lose a family in that time period. So I was trying to find the 1880 census for James Robertson, and I don't think I really found the right family. I looked, um, I did a little bit different search filters. I have James Robertson in Georgetown, South Carolina, 
and um, I, I added race, black, and a spouse name of Susan, and I still got 100,000 plus results. And I looked at some of them and they didn't quite fit, but um, if it was my family, you could keep, keep searching and find more information, hopefully. In uh, 1850 and 1860, if you've gotten back to, um, you know, the family came from Char um, Georgetown, South Carolina. That would be if you were looking at the 1850 and 1860 slave schedules and you thought the family was probably enslaved, um, you'd be looking for slave owners in Georgetown, South Carolina, or somewhere near there. Um, Uh, and you can find those on Ancestry. I did that to a certain extent. So I was looking in for the name Robinson. I should probably also look for Robertson as a slave owner's name because many um, enslaved people when they became free did take the name of a, a previous slave owner. So I, uh, found one, I just looked at one of them. Um, we have um, in close to um, Georgetown, South Carolina is this Richland, South Carolina. And we're, I was gonna look at the Thomas J. Robinson because he is a slave owner. And he had a bunch of slaves, enslaved people listed from the uh, oldest male to the youngest female, basically, all the males and then all the females listed. Mixed up a little bit, but um, we, uh, so there's not, they're not listed in family groups. They're just listed male or female and the age. So it makes it a little hard to figure out if, um, if they could have been. But if you have some people that the right uh, gender and the right age, in uh, a household in the right place with maybe the right last name, then they could be your family. This is what it looks like. Uh, this one's kind of skewed, but, but um, you know, it was handwritten and they were just adding up um, check marks, hash marks for how many enslaved people were there. The, the number 14, that's listed across from Thomas J. Robinson is the number of um, slave houses. So in this case, there were 77 enslaved people living in 14 homes. So that's five or six people per home. Um, and this, if this is 1860, I might wanna also look at the same, same person for 1850. Uh, uh, see if there's other family members that also own slaves. Um, it's, it's, it's really kind of tough, but it's, it's possible. Uh, remember to, now we're kind of going on from the census to vital records, uh, check um, county and state vital record websites to order these, you know, because you want to start with, with uh, your parents and work backwards in time. Try to get all those birth and death records. Sometimes, even though you think you may already know the information on it, there may be some things on there that you didn't know. Marriage and divorce records. Usually these things are not online, but every time I say that, that it's not going to be online, then some of them are added, but there could be more likely the older ones could be online. Remember uh, the effects of segregation. Uh, there could be separate books actually kept for colored at the county courthouses. So if you're visiting a county courthouse, you know, double check that, that there isn't another book for segregated um, at a, you know, during segregation, different books for different people. And also remember that the recording of official government vital records didn't start until late 19th or early 20th century. And that, that's for everyone, that the government 
um, didn't keep track of that information, birth certificates and death certificates. Before then, you, you're going to need to be looking at church records. Uh, and to find the church records, um, if you can find out what church they attended and what records were kept for that church or where that denomination keeps records, um, think about where are the black churches because they may not have been able to go to any, any church, but they there may have been churches where, where the black citizens were welcome and others where they weren't. Um, if possible, make a personal visit to search the tombstones in the church cemetery and, and see if they have original records. Do they have baptismal records? Do they have burial records? You know, marriage records, things like that. Uh, some church members are available, I mean, search church records are available on computer databases, especially I would say at familysearch.org, which is the, the Mormon church has gone around to churches and digitized their records as much as they could. Um, military rec records, African Americans have served in all of America's wars. So mil the, these military records should be available. Uh, pre-World War II records, um, pre-World War I, excuse me, records are held at the National Archives and regional branches. There is a regional branch in Denver, uh, sort of the Rocky Mountain branch. It's actually in Broomfield, if um, you, you know, so you don't have to go to Washington, D.C. See what, what's available. Um, we have some books that have some military records. This Black Defenders of America is um, good background reading for history. The more history you know, the better. Um, Revolutionary War, there were 5,000 African Americans that fought in the con Continental Army. Another thousand fought for the British. And here are some, there are many records available. This is a picture of Crispus Attucks, who was actually the um, one of the first to die of the cause of American freedom because he died at Boston Massacre. Um, Civil War, 240,000 Blacks fought um, and 40,000 died. Uh, the US Colored Troops military service records are actually, can be very important records if, if you had an, um, Black service member that sometimes would, they would sometimes even say what a previous slave owner's name was. Uh, Spanish American War and the Philippine insurrection. There were uh, um, African Americans who served in usually segregated uh, units. Uh, many in World War I to Korea and Vietnam. 350,000 in World War I, a million plus in World War II, uh, 600,000 in Korea, and more than a million in Vietnam. Some of these newer records, like World War II and after, are available through the National Personnel Records Center in St. Louis to find out what's available, although you should still start at archives.gov or the National Archives website. This is the National Archives website. And um, you'll see that, that you can do some research and things like uh, Freedmen's Bank records, um, which, you know, information after the, the Civil War and the US Colored Troops information are, can be found on, on, at the National Archives website. If you're trying to find your own service records or you know a father or grandfather or something, um, it, it sort of helps you through that. None of them come for free unless um, you are the veteran yourself. Um, but if you're you're finding something for a family member, it's it's gonna cost something. Uh, there are voter registration lists available. And um, and of course, they're, they're going to be segregated records again. Uh, this is just from Somerset Homecoming. Uh, and uh, just, just to read, because 
she uh, went through the whole process. Um, my mother had given me all she had to offer. So had the library. I was finished looking at censuses and there were no more records for me there. So she's gone to the library. She's looked at the censuses. Still there were questions. Where were the white families with my family surname? Where did my great great grandfather Fred come from? And was he African? Fred Little John was considered property. To find him, I would have to go to the courthouses in Washington, Tyrell, and Chowan counties near where they lived. That's where the, they kept the bill of sale. Um, enslaved people and slave owner of records you have to look at. Um, before 1860, enslaved people were considered property. To find that last slave owner, check white families with that same surname and any slave owner in the area with, that had slaves listed in the 1860 slave schedules of the gender and age as your ancestors. So there could be a lot of, a lot of checking. <laughs> um, some records such as the Freedmen's Bank records and the US Color Troop enlistment records list former slaves. There are some problems and that you might encounter, things like marriage and naming conventions. Most of the slave marriages weren't officially recorded. Um, many of the enslaved only had first names and there may never be any um, last name recorded until 1870. Uh, after emancipation, an enslaved person could choose any name they'd like. Uh, sometimes they took the name of the current owner or sometimes somebody else that they admired. Uh, this is actually a, uh, from Henry Louis Gates' book, uh, Finding Oprah's Roots. Uh, and he says, the consensus among most scholars is that a majority of slaves took the names of their former masters upon gaining their freedom. Uh, Elizabeth Schoen Mills, a genealogist, had this to say, a sample study from 696 ex-slave testimonies taken between 1871 and 1884 indicate that 71% of the cases, the ex-slave used the surname of the man whom they identified as their last master, and 2% reverted to using the name of an earlier master. So 73%, almost three quarters, were using a, a former slave owner's name. So it's a, it's a good hint. <laughs> um, you may also find things like manumission documents if, if they were freed prior to the Emancipation Proclamation. And often they're part of a will. Um, I haven't found any that actually gave someone their freedom in a will but I have seen um, slaves named as um, they're passed on to a, a family member. Um, also look for farm or plantation records because these are business records and they were kept and they could be at um, on the internet, digitized on the internet. They could be in state libraries or archives, university libraries, private collections of documents. Uh, state and local historic, historical societies, etc. So get get local and see see what records might be held on a local level. And there are things like wills, inventories, appraisements, diaries, advertisements, um, if advertising slaves for sale, all sorts of things like that. Tax records. Um, some owners actually uh, named their name the slaves and maybe recorded ages and genders, births, marriages, things like that is a possibility. Uh, I mentioned the Freedmen's Bureau a few times, but that was established right after the uh, Civil War. Um, they recorded marriage, they were there to help out the new, newly freed slaves. Um, they recorded marriages that had taken place during slaveries, um, assisted with labor contracts, rationing and clothing. They established some hospitals, uh, established aid and refugee camps, and provided some transportation and relocation assistance. It didn't last long though. Um, the Bureau also helped African-American soldiers and sailors file claims for bounties. 
which like land bounties um, and, and, and paid pensions. So sometimes they, they may have had a promise of land rather than payment for their service in the US colored troops. Uh, they opened some um, schools financed by taxes. They ceased functioning by 1872, mostly for political reasons. You know, it's complicated, but uh, so it didn't last long. Uh, there was a Freedman's Bank or Freedman's Savings and Trust. Uh, so they, if uh, someone signed up for the Freedman's Bank, the registers might include a signature date, place of birth, place of res residence, um, age, spouse, spouse's names, father's, mother's, brother's, sister's names, and possibly the former owner's name. Uh, there is a, a, you can search Friedman's bank records or Friedman's records in general on um, Ancestry, but there's also freedmansbureau.com um, that you can search for free, see what records might be available. Uh, I, I just went, since we've been looking at South Carolina, I went to uh, what Freedmen's Bureau records are available for South, South Carolina. Um, there are reports of operations, uh, rules for marriage for freedmen, names of freedmen to whom grants of land had been furnished. So there were, you know, there's some names and some business transactions and things like that available. Uh, this is from Ancestry, and I just searched for Robinson for South Carolina, and I have no, no indication that this is anybody related to um, <laughs> Michelle Obama, but um, I did find. Uh, this is the census of the colored population of York County, Virginia in March, March 11th, 1865. So they actually did a little census um, of I think these people probably were were recently freed in formerly enslaved people and how old they were, their names and things like that. This is um, this is a land sale. Um, from William Bradford to Spencer Robinson, 135 acres on the Thomasville Road, six miles from Tallahassee. It's actually a rental, not a, but at the bottom, here is Spencer Robinson's family. Well, at least, you know, Spencer Robinson and his male family members, his wife is just said wife and their age, uh, Robert Robinson is probably a son and his wife and um, some other children listed. I think at the bottom we have a Rachel and a Lucy. Uh, I looked through a whole bunch of US color troop enlistment remarks. So the, I, all sorts of Robinsons that I could find, I probably looked at a dozen before I found one that actually said um, a former slave owner's name, but this is from Franklin Robinson. And it under the, the remarks, it says slave of I Benninger, Johnson County, Missouri. And this is Missouri. I, I thought that might say Mississippi, but I looked up above and he was actually living in Kansas City, Missouri. And so Missouri was a slave state. Um, there are short share copying records. Some people stayed on the same land that they had been enslaved and maybe sharecropped on that land. Uh, the Colored National Labor Union preserves some of these sharecropping re records. There at the National Archives and the Library of Congress has some records too. Church records. Um, the Mother Bethel, African-American, Methodist Episcopal Church in Philadelphia was um, the oldest organized black church in America founded in 1787. They published a uh, newspaper called the Christian Recorder, which gave information about blacks all over the country from 1865. Um, they also kind of 
reunited people that had been separated by slavery. And uh, this database, informationwanted.org, is um, where you could go to, to see some of those um, missing friends, kind of missing family member ads. And um, so uh, that's a, a great place to look. Other uh, resources for Black church records, the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Co Culture at the New York Public Library has some records. The Amistad Research Center in, at Tulane, which is in um, New Orleans. This is what informationwanted.org, and, and you, can, you can search for names here if you think looking for family. Uh, in the 1930s, the WPA or the Works Progress Administration of the during the Depression uh, collected oral histories from 2,300 former slaves, and so um, great to look there. It, there's some riveting stories about their treatment as slaves, um, but there could be a family if you look at the names. Uh, Ancestry Library Edition has some of these. Library of Congress has a searchable database of these oral histories too. Uh, there are family histories, biographies, autobiographies, and uh, general local histories that could have information about your family. Sometimes they don't aren't specifically about your family, but they'll help you give some of the history of the area to sort of uh, flesh out your family history and give you some more clues. Um, since we are looking in Georgetown County, South Carolina, I just did a Google search and I came up with this journal article uh, called A Demographic History of Slavery, Georgetown County, South Carolina in 1850. Um, and it was published in 1975. And um, I looked at some of the other things that I could do. I could read and download it if I was going through a, um, a college library. We don't have a database, but if you're a college student, LCCC or UW or whatever, you could probably through their library read and download it. Um, I, alternate access option, the, one of the options was pay $10 and you can get this you know, put in your credit card number and you can get this article. I just looked at the preview just to see, and it was pretty interesting, interesting information. Um, another option is if you, you have the citation, you could always do an interlibrary loan for anything, but it's worth looking and just Googling to see what you can find. It's only $2 for an interlibrary loan, so cheaper than 10 bucks for downloading it right there. Um, it kind of told you a little bit about um, what it was like if, if we think that the family is in that area, what, what, the, what kind of, what the, um, well, and one thing it tells you is where the slaves came from and, and basically said that they'd been in the same area for a hundred years. So these are early, probably, you know, before the slave trade was outlawed and came straight from Africa to South Carolina. Uh, if you're trying to get back to Africa, you, uh, it's, it's kind of hard because you uh, must know the point of entry or at least a guess. Find the slave ship and what other stops it made. Find specific areas sailed from because they, they did keep records of, of the ships. Um, and so what tribe or what other information might be found in the business records. But it's really, it's difficult to do that. You kind of have to get lucky. Um, a lot of people these days just do a DNA test and um, ancestry.com and there's a lot of DNA companies, but uh, I've done ancestry. So I, I looked to see what they had. There's 109 regions in Africa and um, it's kind of, shows you sort of a map, covered most of Africa. Uh, there are also 96 African-American DNA communities in the United States that they can give you more information about the, the communities in these different areas. 
Um, here are some of the other DNA co companies, Family Tree DNA, 23andMe, all will give you um, ethnicity down to percentage from different African tribes. Uh, if you need help interpreting that, uh, there are some places like the Genetic Genealogist, International Society of Genetic Genealogy, DNA Explain, things like that. Uh, there are more websites listed in my handouts. This is just one person who took a test from um, um, Ancestry.com and she had 86% of her ancestry from Africa. Probably the other 14% was European DNA, but um, you know, it gave some areas, Senegal, Ivory Coast, et cetera. And I think since they keep re refining this to, to get it down to a little bit closer um, areas. Uh, Afrogeneus is a good place to look. I think it's Afrogenius, Afrogenius. Afro yeah, I'm not quite sure how to pronounce it. But anyway, Afrogenius is a great website. Um, Afro Afro-American Historical and Genealogical so Society is another place to look. Uh, they'll give you some help um, if you want some uh, personal assistance with your genealogy with people that have done it successfully, that's a good place to go. Um, there's also the International Society of Sons and Daughters of Slave Ancestry. Uh, this is the Afro-American Historical and Genealogical Society. And this seemed to be a good website. I, I looked at it, so worth, worth checking out. Uh, remember that we have a lot of genealogy how-to books in the library that you can check out. There are also um, 20,000 genealogy um, and family history books in that you can't check out, but they're in the special collections that you can look at. Many of the, many or maybe possibly most of the information in those books are not in the databases. So that's additional information for you. Uh, research in our genealogy room. I have to tell you that you will have to wear a mask when you're in the library and we have a maximum of three hours in the library. Um, attend future virtual genealogy classes um, on the second Wednesday of every month at three o'clock. Um, if you'd like to ask a question, I think I've gone over a little bit, but um, if you can unmute yourself and ask a question, or you can email me later, or come in the library and, and a staff member or volunteer will, will, will help you do some genealogy. So do we have anyone who'd like to ask a question? I have one. Okay. Um, I found that uh, there's a lot of misspelling. And yeah. I, I wondered if a signature like on the draft card was probably an indication of the very best spelling for a name. Yeah, how they spelled it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, if you can read the signature. Uh, so far. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, you know, I, I have one family member that her name is spelled eight different ways. Yeah. Um, well, well, what, would you, which one, okay, in that case, where I don't have a signature, um, yeah. would you go by um, maybe the grave? Would the grave be the most correct one? The, the grave? Yeah. Um, yes, I would say if it's engraved on the, the, the headstones, um, you know, obituaries, usually um, official documents like a death certificate is, is a primary source. You know, things like what the grave site says or what the obituary says is a secondary source. So, um, but, but barring you know, an official government source, then, then yeah, whatever you can find. <laughs> Hard sometimes. Yes, yes, yeah. And everybody has the same problem. You know, I, you'll, every family, you'll find misspellings or different spellings, or they, 
purposely changed the spelling or something happened or it was just indexed wrong. <laughs> Okay. Well, um, you know, you can certainly ask more questions later. Let's see. Is there a question in the chat? Oh, okay. Just Kathy saying thank you. Okay. All right. Sorry about um, missing the first few slides there, but um, I'm glad that somebody told me that they weren't being shown because I was seeing them. So I thought you were too. Um, if you wanna come next, next month, uh, we're doing Irish genealogy on the, um, it's also the 10th next month. Yeah, March 10th at, at 3 p.m. Okay, all right. I, if, you, if there are no more questions, we'll just stop. Um, please come in the library and, and let us show you some of our genealogy resources here. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Elaine. Thank you, you're welcome.